Hi, welcome to Archaeonomy. The New Zealand Wars were violent and destructive events that were pivotal in the formation of the nation of New Zealand. They're colloquially known as the Māori Wars or the Land Wars, but I'm not a big fan of those terms. The term Māori Wars implies that they were the only wars involving Māori, which is certainly not the case. The pre-European history of New Zealand involved many wars, and the musket wars fought by Māori in the decades before the New Zealand Wars were by far the bloodiest in our history. Calling them the Land Wars because it was a war fought over the control of land, well that's just silly, as countless wars in human history were fought for that reason. As I just said, the New Zealand Wars took place after the Musket Wars, which had given Māori two decades to adapt their warrior culture to the use of firearms, develop the strategies and tactics needed to exploit them, and the engineering to protect themselves from artillery. Traditional Māori pā were fearsome fortresses, but vulnerable to firearms and artillery. Māori developed gunfighter pā specifically to combat those threats, and their skill at military engineering would play an important role in New Zealand wars, as British and colonial forces struggled to attack them. I've marked most of the conflicts into Google Maps for you, uh, though some of them I don't know exactly where they occurred, so I wasn't able to. I've done the best I can considering the time restrictions. Uh, the icon I've used is an Enfield rifle crossed with the Tupara. The Northern War broke out in 1845. Its cause was financial and political. The Treaty of Waitangi, signed in 1840, controversially established British rule in New Zealand. The capital of New Zealand was moved from Kororareka in the Bay of Islands to Auckland in 1841. Customs tariffs were changed, and shipping tended to go to Auckland instead of Kororareka, a major economic blow to Napuhi in the Bay of Islands. Napuhi chief Hone Heke led a group of Māori who cut down the flagstaff at Kororareka in protest. Again and again. In March 1845, Hone Heke and Kawati attacked Kororareka, and the town was destroyed. The refugees were evacuated by HMS Hazard, the USS St. Louis, and the schooner Flying Fish. Homare's pirate Otuihu was bombarded by the HMS North Star and some Māori sided with the government against Heke and Kawati, notably Tamati Wakanene. The British forces were led by Lieutenant Colonel Hume and Lieutenant Colonel Despard. The battle at Pukitutu was a narrow victory for Kawati and Heke, which was followed up by the Battle of Tiahuahu, where Tamati Wakanene defeated Honeheke. Ohiowai saw Despard throw his troops into a costly, near-suicidal frontal assault on a par which was then abandoned. The final battle of the war was Ruapekepeka, where Kawati and Heke withstood an artillery bombardment in a well-designed pa, which was taken by storm in complicated circumstances, and Heke and Kawati escaped with their forces intact. A peace was negotiated, and the Northern War was ultimately an inconclusive stalemate. The Wellington Campaign arose out of the Wairau Fray in 1843, where the New Zealand Company was trying to force a dubious land sale on Ngāti Toa with an armed posse. The resulting firefight saw casualties on both sides, and eventually the posse surrendered. Ngāti Toa chief Terangi Hayata's wife, Rongo, had been killed in the fight, and in retribution, all the prisoners were executed. As a consequence of this, Teropraha, leader of Ngāti Toa, largely withdrew his forces from the South Island, concentrating them around the Pori Rua region. A few years later, conflict inevitably arose in Wellington regarding land sales, and troops burned a Māori village and crops in the Hutt Valley. In retaliation, settler farms were plundered and burned. Bulcott's farm was garrisoned with troops, who were then attacked in a surprise dawn raid. The Navy attacked Motu Karakapa and kidnapped Teropraha, Finally, Tarangi Hayata clashed with troops at Battle Hill, which ended with him retreating into exile. The New Zealand Company settlement at Whanganui had been an area of tensions over land sales for years, as the sale of the land for the town had been a complete debacle. When a minor chief named Narangi was accidentally shot and wounded by a midshipman of HMS Calliope, this was considered an insult, and a party of Māori attacked a settler's home in revenge, killing his wife and children. Five of the murderers were rounded up by Māori friendly to the settlers, and four of the murderers were tried and executed at the Rutten Stockade. A force of Māori led by Ngāti Hoa chief Te Mamaku, who had also taken part in the Wellington campaign, 
came down the river, attacked and burned settlers' homesteads, and effectively besieged Wanganui for two months. At which point the Maori drew the British troops out from the stockades into the Battle of St John's Wood, which was ultimately indecisive. In 1848, Governor Gray negotiated a peace with Tamamaku, who returned to his stronghold at Pipereki. The 1850s saw the creation of the King Movement, a pan-tribal entity that would oppose land sales to Europeans and resist the colonial conquest of their country. They would play a key part in the wars of the early to mid-1860s. The First Taranaki War sparked in 1860. The terms First and Second Taranaki Wars are largely arbitrary divisions, but I use them more or less out of habit. It was sparked by the contested sale of a block of land at Waitara. Troops went to occupy the land, and Wiramu Kingi and his warriors opposed them at Te Kohia Pa. It was bombarded and then promptly abandoned. Settler homesteads and farms were attacked, and the troops fell back to defend New Plymouth, which was encircled with earthwork defences. Warriors from other Taranaki iwi and from the Waikato came to Wiramu Kingi's aid, and a battle was fought at Waireka, west of New Plymouth. The twin pa of Pukitaku Urere and Anuku Kaitara were attacked by Colonel Gold, and his force was decisively defeated. Nati Maniapoto reinforcements arrived and were defeated in incomplete pa at Mahutahi. Gold was replaced by Major General Pratt, who attacked Matariko Riko pa and launched an extensive sapping campaign against Huarangi and Taare. Meanwhile, the British redoubt at Waireka was being surrounded by rifle pits. In addition, while Pratt's army was digging, more and more settler homesteads were being burned to the ground. The third redoubt on the sap was attacked and successfully defended, and eventually a ceasefire was negotiated in 1861. In 1863, the New Zealand government passed the New Zealand Settlements Act 1863, which allowed unlimited confiscations of land from Māori who rebelled against the Crown. Military settlers were recruited from the South Island and Australia to occupy the soon-to-be-confiscated land. The Second Taranaki War erupted that year, triggered by the occupation of the contested Tatramica block and the ambush of a party of soldiers at Oakura. A new British commander arrived, Lieutenant General Duncan Cameron, who commanded the British force that attack and took Poro Pa at the Battle of Katikara. At this point, a new cult that had been spreading amongst Taranaki Māori raised its head. Paimarure. The Māori forces who'd been fighting the British up to this point had largely been Christian. Quite a few educated the mission schools. The Paimarure cult was founded by the prophet Te Ua, mixing biblical and traditional Māori elements, promising its adherents that they would drive the invading Europeans into the sea. They believed in magic and incantations, and their colloquial name of Hohos came from one of their battle chants. They resurrected practices amongst Māori that had not been seen since the Musket Wars. Hohos ambushed a small British force at Te Ahuahu, killing seven, and took trophies from this victory around the country to build support and spread the Paimarae cult. Three weeks later, a force of Hohos attacked the British redoubt at Century Hill in a reckless assault, relying on a magic chant to render their warriors bulletproof. They were gunned down at close range by accurate rifle fire. Gray's hunger for land and his ambition to break the King movement led to the invasion of the Waikato, where British troops aided by ironclad gunboats fought their way into the Waikato heartland. They defeated Māori at Kohiro, fought a bloody battle at Rangarui, bypassed the fearsome defensive line at Patarangi to attack Rangiafia, stormed the trenches at Hyrini, and finally fought the Battle of Arakau. The invasion complete, their land confiscated, Waikato Māori were forced into exile into the king country and Peria near Matamata. The Tauranga campaign was an extension of the Waikato War and involved both actions by imperial troops, such as the defeat at Pukihinehina Gate Pa, and the victory at Taranga, and actions by Aroa Māori with government support elsewhere. The Waikato campaign would provide the government with vast swathes of land for settlers, but the colonial government was nowhere near satisfied. Another disputed land sale, this time at Waitotra, near Wanganui, was used as Cassus Belly to invade South Taranaki and confiscate all the land from Waitotra to Oakura. The British officer corps had had enough of the colonial government's land grabbing and risking their and their men's lives for this to be achieved. A letter exposing it was leaked to the British media. 
and General Cameron gave the order for the staged withdrawal of British troops from the colony and tendered his resignation while in the public argument with Governor Gray. Cameron was ordered to invade South Taranaki, and given the enormous communication time with Britain, his resignation would not be accepted until the invasion was complete. That being said, he did everything possible to avoid conflict, not venturing inland and sticking to the coast, only fighting Maori when attacked, which he was at Nukumaru and Tanaya. This campaign is nicknamed the Lame Seagulls March, after the way his army limped around the coast. Cameron was replaced by Major General Shute, who was a very different man. He launched a short but destructive campaign in South Taranaki, striking in land, assaulting several pa, burning many villages in scorched earth tactics, and engaged in a pointless nine-day-long march inland around Mount Taranaki to New Plymouth. His aggressive actions impressed the colonial government, but he refused to countermand the order for the withdrawal of British troops. Shute's aggression in South Taranaki would not be the end of it, as the colonial major MacDonnell would also carry out scorched earth attacks against Maori villages during his command there. Combating the Paimarie cult would become a priority after this, and campaigns by colonial Maori forces were fought in 1865 in Apotiki, Matata, right the way down the east coast, including battles at Patane and Amaranui, which saved the town of Napier from Hoho attack. Bush campaigns would be fought around Tarawa and Rotorua in 1867. But in 1868, the colonial government would be forced to fight a war on two fronts. In South Taranaki, the Hoho leader Tatokawaru had gathered a force of followers, attacked the colonial redoubt at Turuturu Mokai, and successfully defeated the colonial forces at Tenuto Otomanu and Motoroa, effectively reconquering South Taranaki until his army fell apart at Taronga Ika. And then he had to flee the government forces. While this went on, Te Koti, a prisoner who had been sent to the Chatham Islands with other Maori prisoners, becoming their spiritual leader and founding the Ringatu religion, staged a breakout, hijacking a ship and sailing back to the east coast to take his revenge. His forces rampaged around the east coast, attacking Gisborne at one point and striking into the Bay of Plenty, before he finally fled into exile in the King Country. Different from all these others is Parihaka, which was an entirely one-sided conflict. After suffering from the scorched earth tactics of the British and colonial forces, the Taranaki Maori had given up on armed conflict as a solution to the aggressive tactics of the New Zealand government. Followers of Te Whiti or Rongomai established the Parihaka settlement and began opposing the seizing of Maori land using non-violent methods of civil disobedience. Parihaka ploughmen dug deep furrows through paddocks of European settlers, packed up surveyors' camps and moved them off Maori land, and ripped out countless survey pegs. The armed constabulary arrested the plowmen at gunpoint, keeping most of them imprisoned without charge for years. The Parihakamari changed tactics, building fences across and digging up roads, and more arrests without charges resulted. The prisoners were imprisoned with hard labour, housed in horrible overcrowded conditions in South Island jails, and there were a lot of deaths in custody. Finally, the government sent the armed constabulary into Parihaka itself. They met no resistance, arrested the leaders, looted the houses, burnt the crops, and expelled the residents. The New Zealand wars were a dark but important chapter of our history. I think this map shows that the North Island was a seriously war-torn place. Hopefully this video has helped to summarise the conflicts and will provide some context when I speak later about particular archaeological sites. Thanks for watching, and please share, comment, and subscribe. Cheers!